Welcome back, everybody, to OTT Executive Podcast. I'm Brian Mahoney, the CEO of Trender Research and the president of the 50,000 plus strong OTT Executive Community. We're continuing in our conversation with leaders of the industry. And today we're joined by Paul Pastor. Paul, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me on, Brian. So quick, uh, you know, sort of quick sort of title company and, and uh, we'll jump right into your background. Sure. Uh, so Paul Pastor, I'm one of the co-founders and the chief business officer for Quick Play. Uh, Quick Play is a provider of OTT technology, uh, all built in the cloud stack. Uh, and I, when I say chief business officer, I'm responsible for the sales, marketing, PR, business development, and solution engineering part of our business. Okay, good. So the buck stops with you then. Exactly. I have the revenue number for sure. That's great. That's awesome. So nowhere to hide. So good. Well, one of the things we like to do in this uh, podcast series, Paul, is to sort of personalize some of the lumineers in the industry, get to know you a little bit. Can you just start career background, how you got started, how you got into this crazy industry? Sure. Um, you know, it's an, it is an amazing industry. <laughs> What's so crazy is when you reflect back on it, how many years I now have in the industry, uh, which you never really anticipate you'd be that person, but there you are. Um, but let me just start. Uh, it was kind of a journey uh, that started just prior to going to UCLA Anderson for business school, uh, where I really said to myself, like, listen, I have a strong affinity for media in general um, and want to pursue a career in that in that field. Um, and largely because, I, you know, at the very end of the day, I've always seen media as a big vehicle for social change. Uh, I, as a LGBT member of the LGBTQ community, can remember watching whether it's Golden Girls episodes or then Will and Grace episodes and then Modern Family episodes and, you know, all the way up to most recently, probably something like Pose. And I think that the exposure that media has been able to provide has always been able to help advance some of the social narrative around uh, people in the LGBT community and driving broader acceptance. Uh, so I pursued that with a universal, uh, worked at Universal for a little about a year and a half before going to business school. So that, uh, that was your first job uh, before business school or after business school? That was my first. That was my first media job before business school. Okay. Um, and uh, and really just gave me a quick taste uh, for what the industry had, and I was very lucky to have a couple of different mentors uh, really help me in the process and understand and give exposure to multiple business units. I knew when going to business school, my major objective was to transition into a strategy role within a big media company. Um, Post my experience at UCLA Anderson, I actually took a role at Technicolor, um, so more on the technology side of media, um, in large part because they were really, you know, I worked for a guy named Patrick uh, Mayworm, and he said to me, listen, I will teach you everything you need to know about corporate strategy, and I'll let you run transactions, so let, let's go build this kind of media services practice for Technicolor. Uh, and under his ad, uh, advisory and mentorship, I worked all across India and, and Europe and other locations looking to help build out what would be a technical services operation for us to offshore some of our work. Uh, we built out a joint venture with DreamWorks uh, for the offshoring of some of their animation work. So it was just an amazing time. And when you have an amazing mentor, uh, you just, you know, especially coming right out of business school, it was a fantastic experience. About, you know, 18 months into that venture, I get a call from Disney. Uh, and when you get a call from Disney, you pick up the phone, right? Of course. Right. Uh, and uh, it was a time when Bob Iger had really made the expansion of international one of the core three pillars of the expansion of the, of the business. Yeah. Um, and Disney Channel being a vehicle for that, uh, largely because Disney Channel was a, you know, could serve as a daily touch point with consumers. It was a great way for us to talk about the other things we were doing in our business and importantly drive and create new franchises for the business. Uh, at the time, it was under the leadership of Rich Ross. Um, and he was really beginning to perfect what was that Disney Channel franchise model with the likes of High School Musical and Hannah Montana and My Friends Tigger and Pooh. Uh, and that set the stage for how we could think about growing uh, growing the footprint for Disney Channel. And Paul, that was just time frame. That was 2013-ish. Is that right? This is actually 2007. Uh, okay, crazy. this is okay. First iteration. Got it. First iteration. And one of my first projects there, obviously, w w uh, coincidentally, which I think is very funny, is that uh, Europe was going through uh, digital terrestrial te uh, television uh, conversion, right? And all this available spectrum was coming up. Disney Channel, for example, in a market like Spain had only about 18% penetration in the market through cable. Uh, and broadcast represented a way to reach 100% of households in that market, right? And with, a, with a flip of a switch. So I like to say I was always in the forefront of technology. Uh, at that moment, that was DTT. Uh, we built out the, that within uh, Spain. We did it also in a number of other markets. Mm -hmm. um, Two years into that process, as a function of some of that exposure, 
uh, a guy named Peter Seymour, who longer term became the CFO of the media group, uh, media media group for the Walt Disney Company, um, approached me to say, "Hey, why don't you come and help me run strategy here within Disney?" So I basically, like a couple of years out of business school, was finally achieved, had achieved the goal, working for a great big uh, consumer brand, thinking about the future of media, and structuring that within probably a company that's best known for strategy in the world. Yeah. And um, it was my first day. It was 2009 in this role. Um, it was the height of the financial crisis and recession. Uh, and my boss takes me to lunch. Uh, I'll, I'll put a little joke in here, but Peter made me pay for my own lunch. I think that's how bad the markets were looking at. <laughs> that that's a bad sign, right? There. That's a bad sign, right? When you start, you're like, oh no, like, what am I doing here? Um, but uh, literally right after lunch, he says, I have a project. We have to decide if we want to invest in Hulu. Uh, can you put together a couple of pages on a deck to pre present our perspective? And wow. um, that is one of those things in, the, in the, with that moment. That's really, you know, I look back and like that was the moment where my career trajectory changed all because of its association to one project that lands on your desk, right? Of course. That was a major um, inflection point in the, in the industry too. Huge inflection point. And so um, as been has been written about in many articles, right? There's a lot of internal debate on whether or not we should license our content into an aggregated platform uh, versus keeping it within the ABC br uh, brand. Uh, I supported the, the our, our our negotiations with Ben Pine, Elaine Paul, and Kevin Mayer. Uh, that was our core team uh, mm -hmm. negotiating with Fox and NBC and Provi uh, Providence Equity. Um, we put together a great deal on Avon. Uh, I then operationalized that within the Disney ABC structure. Um, but also associated, that, as you know, kind of the history of Hulu, as soon as we launched Ava, the next question is, when is SFOD? When are we getting to more platforms? When are we getting to bigger businesses? Um, and so it provided for the next eight years a, a, a huge amount of runway of projects mm -hmm. as we evaluate international territories, you know, the, uh, the virtual MVPD business, all of that was in context to Hulu. Um, and it was through that exposure that I really got to become a champion within the Disney ABC world. Uh, th through that exposure, I was also take on, I took on more roles. So outside of strategy, took on media planning, data and analytics, and research for all the Disney ABC television portfolio, uh, working for Ann Sweeney. And that was just, a, I have to say, like probably my favorite job. The When you have all of this data and you, you become like this, uh, I don't know, this uh, somewhat of a magician when you go to a party because you study so much of like human behavior, how people spend or six hours of their lives, right, watching television. So you go and you you start having a cocktail conversation, and and you're like, well, you're you're a person of a certain demographic. You live in this, <laughs> yes. so you do all these things. I bet you your favorite show is this, right? Right. Uh, and so you're probably was, right. You're probably right. popular at parties too, right? Oh, you have the data always, head. right? Always, yeah. always. So uh, I absolutely love that job. I thought that also, you know, being associated with Disney, uh, seeing the incredible growth, what's such a, a brand with such strong consumer affinity. Uh, and then having some incredible content at the time, um, it was just, it was a fantastic place. So okay, transitioning from there. That takes up to what, what, what time frame? 2015. And okay. I get a call from Rich Ross, who was running Disney Channel uh, many years back in the day. And he's appointed to become the new president of Discovery. And uh, he sends me a note. He says, come over for a drink tonight. <laughs> and I was like, I kind of know where this is going. Uh, so oh, I was said, he going to pay for we... this drink or were you going to have to pay for that one yourself? I didn't have to pay for this one. He was, he uh, was at me at the house, but my immediate <laughs> words back to him, to him where I'm was, I'm originally from Washington, DC. And I said, I'm not moving back to Washington, DC. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but through a series of conversations, Rich brought me on at the discovery, uh, as basically a COO across discovery science in all planet and velocity channels. Uh, and we helped, you know, take this discovery to its best year ever in 2015, uh, helped Science Channel achieve its best years through 2017. Uh, but it was obviously uh, a very interesting inflection point in the industry, right, from 2015 to 18, when, you know, the cable business was showing its maturity. Yep. Uh, you were starting to see declines in households because of, uh, you know, some of the changes in the way packaging was board, occurring. Board cutting starting to happen, yep. Certainly uh, starting to really accelerate, right? Uh, digital was beginning to erode at some of the value proposition. Uh, nothing was, you know, and cable companies were still far behind. I mean, Discovery in 2016 was still launching TV everywhere as it's, you know, the first time uh, when the industry was very quickly advancing toward this kind of streaming, you know, all street, all in streaming world. Yeah. 
Um, so it was a, a great time. David Zaslav as leader, as leader, um, and you know, working with Rich. Um, it's a very different company and a very, very different culture. Disney's a company that really focused on, you know, we are, we knew direct consumer was going to happen in 2018, back in 2011 when we were working on it for the board. Um, in Discovery, it was about the focus of the quarter and what are you driving, what are you delivering, and that yeah. was. A, and I think TV everywhere is a kind of a different, you know, beast, right? Because it was more kind of multi-platform, multi-device, not necessarily the full kind of promise of of streaming, right? That's right. Absolutely. Um, well, and it, was, it, was, it still is frustrating to consumers, right? It's not like going to figure out your logins and having to log into another screen and come back. And then what do you what do you yeah. actually subscribe to? Um, it was never a great consumer experience. It was the interim you know, bridge to be able to maintain right. value within the, within the cable ecosystem, right? Yeah. As people were building out these more direct to consumer platforms. And, and that's right around the time that we met. I think um, early in your career there, you you were a speaker for my OTT Executive Summit um, yep. some time back. And so take us from that point to you know where you are now. Sure. So uh, what uh, from between discovery and then essentially where I am today. Yeah. Um, first thing I saw when I was in around 2018, I sat down with Rich, uh, and he's and I said, "Listen." If you're not looking to renew, I, I I have an idea I really want to pursue. And it was really reflecting back on kind of Hulu and the international launches that we did in 2011, 2012, and their ultimate failure, right, in, in, in exporting that model. And the reason being is one is at the time, you know, at the very end of the day, Netflix, Amazon, et cetera, in 2011, weren't on the shores of many of these international markets. So there really wasn't a burning platform or at least a perceived competitive threat. The second piece is that the regulators themselves, right, really weren't in favor of broadcaster collaborations due to the fact that they're, they had so much concentration in the ad market that they saw this as anti-competitive. And then the third piece was that, you know, Disney, Fox, and NBC went forward with an untested platform in international that could barely support multi-currency, let alone multiple languages. Mm -hmm. But if you thought about that flashing forward in 2018, there finally, there was a burning platform, right? Broadcasters were most certainly beginning to see their share erode as these uh, broad, global broadcast, uh, sorry, blo global streamers were really beginning to take share. Second, as you saw Ofcom and the EU regulators really uh, encourage collaborations because they saw the threat to broadcast and importantly, the public service broadcasters that play such an important role in news and information and in their communities. And then third, at, and partnering with a guy named Eric Huggers, we thought we had a better idea on how to build the platform itself and help, you know, essentially these green shoots of Salto and France and uh, and join in Germany and BritBox in UK, figure out how to scale their data product and tech. Now, ultimately, Eric and I still joke about this. I think we were just a few years early, and I will never forget a French broadcaster telling me that they were going that this was that they were going to take a couple of interim steps before they got to this moment. I said, "You're just going to be further behind." He goes, "Yes, but we're European, and we're that's the way we operate." Right? Yeah, it's a different animal altogether, that's for sure. <laughs> So, but, you know, at the very end of the day, I, I respect it, right? I still respect the, like, the, the ventures that were going and, and the fact that it was culturally different. And, and of course, the dynamics are different. Um, but we worked on that for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, um, I always like to call it, we're trying to pull off the triple Lindy, which is a reference to Rodney Dangerfield back in Back to School, uh, which is, you know, Rodney Dangerfield in that moment, you know, is trying to pull off this perfect dive, jumping from the 10 meter diving board, doing a flip landing on the three meter diving board, doing a flip, and then landing on the one meter diving board and doing a flip and, and landing in the pool perfectly, which was the challenge that we essentially faced when we were trying to put this venture together, which was we needed multiple markets to commit to the platform. We needed the funding to come behind the, the platform at the same time. And the, ultimately we had to have the platform in hand. And getting two of those three was always something we could do. The third one was always the trick. Add uh, in the regulatory challenges too, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And just fundamentally, you know, I, I think we had an idea and I think that it still was the right idea. I think we were just too far advanced. Uh, we were too far out uh, from where the politic was. Right. And that matters uh, in terms of how think people think people perceive how they can collaborate. Right. It took a long time at Hulu for Disney, Fox and NBC to say we'll work together. Even this new sports venture with ESPN and Fox and Warner. I'm assuming, you know, it takes a lot. There's like needs to be this huge imperative uh, to be able to drive and uh, forcing function behind collaboration with a competitor. It's uh, like step level, right? You got to iterate a little bit, but you got to get enough of it right to kind of chunk it out as you kind of launch it to the marketplace, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I pivoted back 
And in 2020, just uh, <laughs> literally in March of 2020, uh, I was introduced to this, the team at Quick Play and asked to come on board as chief business officer and a co-founder of, of, of Quick Play. Um, at the same time, I uh, was working with some Disney colleagues on what was a consolidation and aggregation play around the medium to long tail services called Stroom. Yep. Um, and I made the uh, the very difficult personal choice to try take on both ventures at the same time, which I would not wish on my own worst enemy. <laughs> um, but it was a, a it, it was a, a really great way to keep me occupied during COVID and uh, and keep me busy with two roles. Um, ultimately, Stroom uh, was not successful in large part. I think we just didn't pivot fast enough in response to the market and from a D to C. Proposition to a B to B to C proposition, where I think we could have gained traction through operators and OEMs. Yeah. Um, that being said, uh, you know, really, I've been very fortunate with the co-founders that I have here at Quick Play. Um, we have a. Yeah, I always like to talk about the the mix here. We have a Norwegian CEO, a Chilean CTO, a Indian COO, and myself. I think that unique combination of perspectives and cultures has allowed us to succeed. Um, in the fact that we see problems in advance because we have the different sets of eyes and lenses. Yeah. Uh, but we also share a culture of like hey, a really client oriented client service and just making sure we solve problems. Um, so it's been an incredible ride with some uh, really great clients. And you went through a rebrand a couple of years ago, right? That's right. It was originally called First Light. That's right. um, and after a year of saying we're the old quick play, uh, we also we decided it was easier just to say we were Quick Play. Yeah. Um, but just to give you a quick history of, of Quick Play, essentially, we were founded in 2004, putting video over Blackberries, if you can believe it, at the time. And that was the cool thing. Ultimately, in 2016, AT&T bought Quick Play to help build out their common video platform to, to help support all their direct to, concert, uh, direct to consumer ambitions. Um, and in 2020, as we all know, AT&T over... Over eight, I uh, was looking to shed some assets. Mm -hmm. um, so we took that opportunity to partner with private equity, buy out the IP and the engineering team and the investments that made against the platform to really take that uh, the technology and focus on what we call tier one OTT solutioning. Uh, yeah. And so that's really the focus of the business. Well, and it, the rest is history. I miss my black bear. I remember those days, you know, it's like, <laughs> this wasn't meant to be. You got to adjust, right? You become a dinosaur fast if you just sit still and do nothing. Absolutely. I mean, I, well, I remember being so jealous of my friends that had Blackberries, you know, when they first got them. Uh, and then eventually I got my own and then you realize how attached you are for to work. And then you make the transition to an Apple iPhone. And you're like, oh, my gosh, no keyboard. And uh, that was a tough transition of itself. But now, I mean, considering the, the fact that we walk around with small computers every day is an amazing fact. Yeah, remember uh, Secret Service had it just Obama held on to his Blackberry. He's probably like the last person in the world still on a Blackberry. And they're like, wait a minute, this isn't very secure. No, not at all. Not at all. But uh, so, yeah, but it's always been fun to be part of a kind of a technology change. And I feel that's really, I mean, where the, at this moment, especially in OTT, there's so much on the horizon in terms of change. It's going to be an incredible. All business. right, cool. Th that's a great segue. So thank you for that uh, career background. I think it's very helpful. And, and you sort of follow the path of the OTT industry, the inflection points in terms of your career, companies you've launched or co-launched, um, really exciting. And I, and I think that kind of you know, kind of builds and flushes out sort of um, your experience in this industry. So take us, where are you right now? Like, you know, snapshot and quick play, like what, what's your focus? Where do you see the opportunities? Sure. So we very clearly, we break out the market into three segments, right? So just to talk about it. Um, so we're, we're first of all, focused exclusively on media sports and I would say operator tier, you know, media services, right? So that's, a, right. The, that's the core focus of what we do from a product perspective. We're an OTT platform, so we do everything end-to-end, -end, whether that is media services, AV pipeline, your content management system, which is really the heart of the operation, and your front end. Uh, but we exclusively focus on tier one. So let me break out those the, the respective tiers and how we think about the market. Okay. The tier zeros are those that are the Netflix, the Disneys of the world that generally uh, have huge global scale. They generally focus on in-house build. They'll right. occasionally look for point solutions to help them advance a, a certain feature, uh, but they're not our primary focus because they have long decision cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we're we're a startup company. Uh, I, but I like that tier zero. Like they're big, but they're they're not zeros. It's just they don't they do everything internally, right? They do everything internally, and and like I said, we're happy to partner. And the way our technology is built, it's modular. 
Uh, so we can offer point solutions into that. And occasion, we'll have a client that will bring us in for a point solution opportunity. But in general, that's not our focus. Okay. Then we then we break out the second group, which is like the tier twos, right? And those are of, of smaller scale, great businesses, serve the passion verticals that Stream was hoping to aggregate. Um, but in large part, you know, they're they're really pure OTT streaming businesses. They don't have the complexity of legacy businesses, ad stacks, all, all the things you can possibly imagine, legacy cho choices in, in technology and vendors um, that a tier one would, right? So a tier one for us is somebody completely focused on service in that media consumer space. Uh, but has a, probably a com more complex ecosystem, okay. is looking to service more business models, looking to service across multiple markets. Uh, and that's really our sweet spot. And, and they uh, probably have um, better financing. They probably have more subscribers, more viewers, right? So it's more mature, right? right? And they got tech stacks all over the place and they got international. So it, it's a it's more to get wrap your arms around, right? That's absolutely right. So the it, it's exactly right. They're looking for something that can support large scale, right? So we're partnering with Madison Square Garden and Yankee Sports Network, right? So they're looking for huge scale within sports and live streams. Uh, you'll see that within uh, Rogers Sportsnet also here in, in North America with, in, in Toronto. We recently announced Coach Co here in North America, and we have a number of, of representative clients around the globe. But they have really complex ecosystems, to your point, really large scale, um, and are looking to leverage not only our tech, but the cloud to be able to handle and support that transformation. And how do you win? Like, what, what's your, I mean, you know, USP, right? Like, how, how are you, like, why do people come to Quick Play versus the other platforms that are out there? Oh, I'm so glad you asked this. I know, I had to ask it, right? I'm so glad you asked it because it, it's it, it's so, listen, I come from the media side of the business and I translate that into the technology side. And I still always like to introduce myself in any meeting and say, like, I play an engineer on television. Like, I am not an engineer. Um, and I'm very grateful for the team that I have that supports me in that in that effort. But I would say that's that was the exact question I was kind of asking when I was both inter, you know going through this process and partnering with these guys. But more importantly, as I think about like how do we go to market, like what is the difference, and how do you communicate that to both the most sophisticated buyers in the industry and somebody who's actually a little bit built like me who has problem statements but not necessarily like um, an understanding of how that all gets solved, right? Mm -hmm. So I love your question because um, I focus on that. A, very, a lot within our marketing team. So for us, it comes down to, I'm going to talk about it, one, in terms of the platform and the architecture, and two is culture. Okay. So on the on the platform architecture side, we say architecture matters. And the, the reason we try to get clients to focus there is that so many RFPs come out and it's like, do you have this feature? Do you have this feature? Do you have this feature? And everybody clicks the box and says, yes. It's a checklist. Yeah, I've seen it's it a million times. Yep. And it's, it's not strategic. It's about a point in time, whether or not you have a thing or don't have a thing. But more importantly, all of our competitors also have enough engineers to build something if you need it, right? Or can partner with it and figure that piece out. So that's not a great way to approach an RFP. For us, we always like to think about, okay, how do you future-proof your business, right? Um, and if you're thinking about future-proofing your business, you should be asking different questions. So one thing in architecture, right, that we like to talk about first is the fact that we're completely cloud agnostic and cloud native. So we can work with a multi-cloud situation. We can help you do, drive the transformation, help you figure out the scale. But importantly, being built in the cloud, we didn't take a black box and just pour it into the cloud. It's built to be able to help you manage a lower cost TCO because of the efficiency of how it's running. Yep. The second piece of that architecture is that it's all open API driven, which ultimately means that coupled with the modularity that I was alluding to earlier, right? So we have 250 microservices, that it means you can continue to extend the capabilities of your platform. So you're not stuck in a black box trying to create a bunch of custom code. You literally can bring in partners or build out uh, components that can, that can connect through an API that ultimately give you greater functionality. And if there's a spike somewhere in those 250 microservices uh, in, a, in innovation um, and you want to take advantage of it, right, you can shut down a couple of the microservices and plug that, that other okay. solution in really quickly and easily, right? So, so that's it's not like a, you know, closed ecosystem, you know, not invented here type of that, you know. Exactly, attitude. exactly. And the last piece is that we're dedicated instance, which means for each one of our clients, we actually create an instant, uh, a dedicated instance of the platform for them. Okay. 
Uh, and so what does that mean, right? And so this again goes back to me being a buyer and my, in my on the, sitting on the buyer side in my prior lives, right? It means that I understand that there's a moment when the CEO of the company or a board member of the company or a senior person in the team walks in and says, I saw this last night on so-and-so, I want it. And you don't sit in a long product prioritization cycle that a standard OVP would have because yeah. the standard OVP has a shared infrastructure with thousands of clients. And so you're just one of many asking for resources. Mm -hmm. In a dedicated instance, we can say, no problem. You control the roadmap. So you get to control when and how we deliver. And it gives everybody a, a huge time to market advantage in terms and a responsiveness competitive advantage, right? So yeah. that's how I think about platform and creating difference versus our competitors. Yeah. And it, I, I've run product organizations that are multi-threaded that way. And it presents some challenges, right? Because now you've got, you know, you've got all these different parallel product roadmaps that you got to manage, but there's a lot of benefits too, because you can sort of, uh, you know, kind of build out that, that capability and then over time share it across, right? And, and overall the, the product sort of strategy and platform gets stronger for all of your customers, right? That's right. I mean, 90 to 95% of our code is still shared, Yeah, but they're getting a dedicated instance, but it's the layer on top that we can add, like, like I said, with those open, the open API nature and the integrations that we'll do to that, to that partner who has made certain uh, choices around their architecture or otherwise, that's yeah. really where we can add a competitive difference. And like I said, it gives us a huge ability to say, you control the roadmap, you control the timeline. You're not sitting behind 10 other people trying to do a product prioritization exercise. Yeah. And, so and there's the white label platforms out there that'll get you started, you know, like the Oteros of the world and, and they right. serve a really good purpose. So the companies like that. Um, but I think your focus and your product strategy kind of align, right? You're, you're focusing on those tier ones, very complex. Um, and they don't want to have just cookie cutter approach. That's right. And there's many times where we'll get approached for an opportunity on this and we'll, I'll simply say, it's just not for us, right? There's an, it's, it's, we're going to be too complex a solution for them. Um, there are simpler, lower cost solutions that they should be pursuing and chasing. It's really staying in the lane of, of the tier ones that make the difference. Okay. So great product strategy. You are going to tell me about the other selling proposition, which is culture. Culture. Um, and you can't, you know, having especially been part of, you know, I would say two startups in the last, in the last four years um, that started at the same time, I can't say enough about how culture makes a difference, right? Um, so... I think that there is both a shared ethos and in, in the company, and we see it in our net in ENPS scores, right? There's a huge number of promoters within our company. People enjoy the work. They love the solution, the, pro the problems we present to them. Uh, but importantly, the things that we prize around being curious and being a team player that, that have resonance within the company. Um, but I also think it goes back to that kind of quote, that founder core uh, that has the ethos of also trying to solve problems and be and sit down with a customer and be strategic. And so when you can sit there and have those conversations and not not be just a pure vendor relationship, mm -hmm. I think that's when you begin to really make inroads and uh, and creates a lot of business opportunity. So I think it's that unique combination of both. It does. Culture matters for sure. You know, and it's that partnership, you know, kind of approach you take with your customers. Uh, I'm sure you're, you know, you, you, you build relationships, you become friends with some of the some of your customers over time, right? Um, Absolutely. So uh, let's switch gears. A customer the other day come uh, bring me a uh, a uh, a can of maple syrup that he and his father had literally canned that weekend before, uh, just because of the friendship we would develop, right? And the that's number not. Of oh, I love hearing stories like that. I mean, we we do these uh, OTT executive community meetups, and it's a great group of people, and we'll see a bunch of them next week at NAB and um, future shows, and and it's it's nice when you like the people you work with, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, could, could it say, uh, I couldn't put a finer point on it. Um, I am sure like you though, it's, it's one of those things where the week before NAB or a couple of days before NAB and here we are. And some of it's a little bit of dread at heading into Vegas, but the second you get there and you start walking around, you realize how many people, you know, and how much fun it is. And like, and catching up, I absolutely get so much energy off of it. It's just, yeah, I know there, there might be a hundred thousand people there, but it feels like a pretty small industry, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it Especially does. been in it as long as we have. So um, let's switch gears a little bit, Paul, if you don't mind. So thank you for that update in your career and the company and everything. I, I'd like to swim upstream a little bit and talk about the major trends in the industry. And maybe I know you have an announcement that you want to talk about as well. So what, what do you see as like the big trends that are shaping the industry right now? Sure. So on the, on the largest macro level, right, um, what we see at this moment is that 
the, the major broadcasters and almost all across the globe, we actually see this as a trend is that everybody's trying to right size their business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there was a period of, uh, of investment that we've seen out of other startup cycles, right? Which is spend, 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 acquire consumers, no matter the cost. Um, and then let's figure out the business model later. Uh, we're now in that, let's figure out the business model now uh, phase as Wall Street puts a lot of pressure um, that, and fundamentally, I think the strikes of last year also uh, have reshaped and refocused the business in terms of, you know, the content spend and marketing spend we're going to see across these enterprises. So that's number one is, is I think that there's just a right sizing of the business. And as a function of that, in our role, people are looking at their technology stacks, maybe some of those decisions to have all those in-house uh, uh, components where they may say, actually, there might be more efficient ways for us to acquire some of that technology. Uh, and we can focus on our core, which is really around marketing, distribution, brand, uh, and content development, right? So let's maybe leverage some of the community and the, and the innovation occurring there. Um, so I think that that's one of the one of the things we're seeing and, and we're most certainly capitalizing on. The second piece across the globe, right? And we we've been talking about cloud probably for like I don't know a decade, but we're still we're still in that a period of transformation. There's many people who are still on on prem, uh, so we're looking at how do we create these cloud based solutions that help them drive scale and importantly, uh, drive you know also reduce latency and all those other things that are a function of how we operate yes. in the cloud. Um, so that most certainly is a large trend and the transformation effort can't be, un, you know, we can't understand, under, underestimate the amount of work that's required for a broad transformation like that, moving those workflows into the cloud. Um, the third one, right, which I'd be remiss in talking about is, is AI, right? I mean, this is, there it is. Um, it, it, you know, you expected me to say it, of course I'm going to say it. Yes. But, you know, I think that what we can't underestimate is about February of last year when OpenAI came out with uh, ChatGPT, how much that really just began to trans they change the tr the conversation. And I know sitting with our cloud partners and sitting in their sales meetings, uh, their emphasis, for example, sh shifted from let me get a commitment right to let me now talk to you about all the tools that are available in our cloud environment right in all these new marketplaces. Um, and as a function, and that's why some of the, the shift we have in terms of talking about architecture, because architecture enables the, the access to those marketplaces and importantly, your ability to solve some of the challenges you might have, whether that is, you know, marketing related, acquisition related, or importantly, search and discovery related, but it drives engagement. Now at IBC, we had announced that we were, we had created a search companion app, right? At the, at the front end for a consumer. For them to be able to ask, you know, a query about, hey, I'm headed to Italy for a vacation. I'd love to see movies that have scenes of Italy in it. Um, great. All right. Let me let me showcase. And instead of just le leveraging, met, you know, general metadata that was available to them, uh, which might not include those scenes that have Italy, right? We use the Google Veritex platform. We use a large language model and Google Voice Assist to essentially then grab all of the data from the internet, pair that against a CMS result. So what's available for a consumer to watch and yep. said, actually all of these movies that you have access to are now available to, you know, have scenes of Italy in them and you should watch. Mm -hmm. And then we can prioritize them based on what we already know of their personal viewing habits, right? And what they've watched recently and all those other pieces that even personalize that further. The, what we're going to be teasing out at NAB, right? Is, hey, how do I then make that in a really great programmer tool? Um, what I always think about is like, how do you replicate the success of your best programmer across your entire service? Yep. And that's exactly what we're doing by kind of looking at the inverse of what we created, a, a, we showcased at NAB, uh, which is, you know, putting a programmer tool that allows for that same capability. How can I, through a casual language learning model, right? Uh, large language, sorry, excuse me, casual language query, but long, a large language model, ask and, and begin to program the service. So, so you're talking about a content curation or you're also talking about like content, you know, tagging your metadata and all that fun stuff. Sure. So it's a, a great question. So it's at this moment, we're operating within a live query environment, right? You could imagine you could also store some of that, that those query results and append them to actual uh, content within your CMS over time. Okay. Um, but let me just give you get smarter example. over time based on the queries, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you could always store that information. The, the great example though would be like today, right? We're here we are talking about uh the eclipse, right? Yeah. That's happening. Which is about um, to happen. It's probably gonna get a little dark in my office at some point. So so there you go, right? But the reality is, is that there's probably movies that have eclipse. If you're a news organization, there have been eclipse across the globe, across 
uh, the U.S. You know, I think the last one was in 2017 or something like that. I don't remember. But if you were just a programmer, you said, hey, show me all the results for eclipses, right, that we have sitting within. And while it may not be tagged everywhere, right, if we are leveraging the whole entire Internet to be able to source and produce uh, a result, right, you can very quickly begin to program. Um, and then again, apply those those models where personalization begins to drive the relevancy of the result in front of that consumer. That's a fantastic you know, uh, experience. And that drives more engagement, which ultimately drives more monetization opportunities. So that's the tool we will be presenting at NAB. Oh, well, congratulations. I mean, I think that is very practical, you know, adaptation of what AI represents. There's a lot of buzz and, you know, around it. Some of it, I think, is... Um, you know, is just that is buzz. But when you actually apply it in a practical way to something that can improve your viewing experience, you know, improve use of the data that you already, you know, have, um, increase uh, that sort of handshake between the content and content discovery for the viewer over time. I think that's marvelous. So kudos to you guys. Thank you. Well, uh, most certainly it is, it's, you know, one of the, going back to some of the company ethos, I think that there is one which is always for us to remain ahead of the curve. Uh, we're very lucky um, that we've done both of these pieces with both IBC and, and NAB with Google, who's been a great partner to us uh, in helping us build and advance some of our product roadmap in this area. Um, so we're excited to showcase it at NAB. Are you doing a demo at NAB? Can we come by and check it out? Uh, you most certainly can. All right, great. Awesome. We'll do that then. So um, I, I do want to shift gears here. Um, we love to sort of personalize um, these interviews and just get to know a little bit more about some of the leaders in the industry. And so we always like to close with asking, you know, personal hobby or interest that you can share with our audience. Sure. So uh, I'll give you a personal hobby, but I actually want to hit one other note before we go. Oh, sure. Which is just to encourage we, as you know, Quick Play has been now a sponsor of LGBTQ plus ally events um, at CES, NAB and IBC. Uh, we'll be doing the same at NAB, helping to just to showcase the diversity of the talent that sits within the community and how to create uh, avenues for those that are looking to explore uh, jobs and and, and uh, careers within our industry. So I uh, highly encourage those who know us uh, to stop by our happy hour uh, on Monday at NAB. Uh, but importantly, uh, you know, reach out to me if they would like to get behind supporting the cause, which is something that's very important to your question. Uh, the second piece is like, what are my more enjoyable hobbies? Um, well, I will tell you, so I recently moved to Miami about a year and a half ago, and I realized that the best way to meet new people is to play tennis. This is a tennis driven town. Okay. Um, so while I, you know, was a decent, you know, uh, occasional player uh, up until high school, I dropped it for 30 years and now I'm getting back into it. Um, but through the kind of experience of, of playing, I've become such a huge fan of watching tennis. Um, so I went to the last year, the French Open and the U.S. Open and just went to the Miami Open here. The Miami Open, Miami Open was really special because uh, Collins, who was the finalist and ultimate winner of the championship, uh, she was the undergrad at UVA. So I was cheering on a fellow Wahoo uh, while sitting in the stands. Um, and uh, I've just really come to enjoy that kind of fan experience in that community. I will tell you, I do have a little bit of a beef uh, with, with tennis viewing. Uh, you do have to subscribe to a cable offering in order to be able to get the tennis channel, which is an additional add-on. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, basically an, an 80 to $90 investment to have the tennis channel in your house. Oh, is that uh, much? I didn't realize that. Okay. Well, just because you have to have that MVPD offering and then the tennis channel. Uh, yep. There isn't a tennis channel direct-to-consumer offering that covers the live games um, on the main courts. Uh, you have to go through cable. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. And it's so I have to tell such, you such focus on direct to consumer and and there's gaps there where you still have to get the bundle. You still have to get the bundle. And that's one of them. So that is my life's mission to try and figure out how to help you correct that. <laughs> All right. Well, I know some people you can talk to, but um, I, I can't let you go, Paul, until you introduce those puppies behind you. They're still on the couch there. They're still on the couch. I have uh, Betsy and Toby here. <laughs> They're both napping. So you're just not sharing very out. But uh, they're most certainly enjoying it. So we've had we've had several dogs in the show. Um, some a little noisy. Let's see, we've had a parakeet. We've had all sorts of animals. We we have two Scottish terriers at our house here, and uh, they're they're like that. They're they're just wallpaper. They're in the background, hanging out. You just forget they're there sometimes. Exactly. If I close the door, that's the only time that they'll notice that there's a you know, hey, we need to get out. So I'm best to keep them in here. Well, that's awesome. Well, Paul, I really enjoyed spending this time with you. Um. 
thank you so much. I'll be I'll be looking to uh, connect next week in Vegas. Um, I would love to see a demo of your AI technology. That sounds really cool. I'm still in learning mode there. Um, there's a lot to learn. Um, but I think when you get down to brass tacks of actually implementing it in terms of, you know, real product that you can interface with and interact with, that's when a lot of the light bulbs go on. So um, looking forward to that. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I look forward to seeing you at NAB. Uh, and uh, again, appreciate the invitation. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, this is once again, Brian Mahoney, the CEO of Trend Research and president of the OTT executive community. We've been joined by Paul Pastor from Quick Play. Thanks again, Paul. Thank you. All right. Signing off, everybody. Have a great day. <laughs>